This talk is, uh, has nothing to do with science. It has nothing to do with technology, which is what everything here has been about. Okay. This is a, a discussion, and I don't really have the answers you're going to hear at the end uh, of what to do in this situation. But as my practice has evolved and matured, I'm now faced with a multitude of battery replacement surgeries. And when these patients come back to me, they, most of them are doing pretty good, but once in a while, they're really not doing well. And they are at the end, close to the end of their life, and their Parkinson's is stage five. But they still want their batteries replaced because they haven't given up yet. And so what I want to talk about today is some of the considerations, things to think about when these patients come to your clinic, um, things that are ethical about it, a little bit of ethics. I'm not an ethicist. I don't really like ethicists, actually. They just get in the way of trying to help us make good decisions <laughs> for our parents. <laughs> but I did read some ethics papers. And then um, talk about how we've started and evolved to approach this challenge of the end-stage Parkinson's patient. Let's see, how do I advance my slides here? OK, so this is a case. I, I did have sentinel case up there, but that's actually a really bad term. I didn't realize how bad it was. <laughs> like severe complication associated with, anyway, this is not a complication. This is just a, something that opened my eyes. A 74-year-old patient of mine, uh, he had young onset Parkinson's, used to be a universe, university professor, very high functioning people. Uh, in fact, his daughter subsequently went to medical school, and at the time of this challenging case, she was a medical student. Um, originally was implanted for his tremor dominant Parkinson's in 2002 in the VIM uh, in Portland. Uh, he had good benefit, but then he developed progressive Parkinson's on DOPA. Typical story. So I put in a bilateral subthalamic leads. He had good benefit at that point. He had a dual channel and a single channel battery. Um, interestingly, we never ended up turning the VIM back on. We always just used the STN for his tremor. Uh, and he did okay, but he, he really advanced in the last few years. And when he came back to see me for his battery replacement the last time, uh, he, was, he looked terrible. I mean, you walk in the room and he's, he can't talk. He whispers. You can't even really collect a history from him. He's severely akinetic rigid. He's in a nursing facility, basically. He'd been made DNR and he was on hospice. But his family says his battery's dead. We really need you to replace it. And I'm like, well, you look pretty bad to me. I'm not sure we should do that. Well, so I said no. And then they went to the neurologist. And the neurologist said, no, you have to. So I said, OK, I'll do it. So we replaced the battery. Everything went fine. He went home. And it was about two months later that he went ahead. I think he got a pneumonia and died. And family decided not to do anything there. So I mean, really, I mean, should I have replaced this patient's battery? Should I have spent the tens of thousands of dollars in a medical procedure, put the patient at medical risk for something that has maybe limited benefit and in somebody who's not going to live very long. I mean, as neurosurgeons, we do a lot of things to people that are about to die. I mean, it's hard for us to say we shouldn't be doing this when we're treating brain metastasis with gamma knife all the time and people have very limited survival. Okay. So this kind of case is what I'm talking about. Here's the dilemma, right? So we put uh, DBS leads in patients with Parkinson's before they're disabled. That's a contraindication. And it's very effective for many of the symptoms. We know tremor, rigidity, uh, motor fluctuations, uh, dyskinesia. But it doesn't help everything. And the disease continues to progress. And the things it doesn't help are what gets the patient to stage five. Gait disorder, cognition, pretty much most of these people get some degree of dementia. Uh, Swallowing, weight loss. These these are the end stage issues, and I'm trying. To, I'm waiting for the movement disorder neurologist to shake their head. Yes, yeah, I don't know. Right. This is the real challenge at the end. Okay. And the bat, DBS doesn't help those symptoms. It really doesn't. So most batteries last two to four years. So it, every DBS patient, well, is going to come back to you with this problem at some point. What do we do? Do we say no to battery replacement when they're stage five? Can we say? Is it ethically appropriate to say no? So um, in preparation for this talk, I did a little retrospective review of some of my patients. Um, and I looked in the literature. This is a neat paper. 2000, 211 Parkinson's patients had died. And they went backwards. 
and looked at a lot of information about them. The average age of onset was 64, no surprise. The average age of death was, age of death was 78. You, typical disease progression duration was 12 years. But it, we all know it's a huge range. So you're going to have a lot of these patients. We typically implant at five to eight years of disease. They get battery replacements every three years. And at some point, they're going to be at the last step right here. Do we replace the battery? So I made a list of things to consider. It's, you know, I don't consider these in every patient, but um, these are the things that I think about when the patient comes to see me. Uh, you know, what are the medical factors for this patient? Are they medically progressed? Are they getting frail? Are they emaciated? Are they on a bunch of anticoagulations? I mean, is it medically reasonable to do surgery? Um, you know, something to think about is the cost. It, it, this doesn't cost me anything except my taxes. Uh, usually doesn't cost the pa patient anything because their deductibles probably met. They're all Medicare patients, so it's really costing Medicare. And um, when we get into some of the ethics thoughts about this, it's, you know, at some point we have to be responsible with our medical dollars. Does it make sense to do it for the cost? Uh, who makes the decision to, to replace the battery at this point? Is it the doctor's decision? Is it the patient, the family? Um, consent. I mean, most of these patients are not able to give a true consent for surgery. They have dementia. They can't think clearly. Yeah, you, you don't even trust their ability to understand what you're talking about. Um, so there's issues of consent, and that gets into challenges with family members. We've all seen the family where you have one child says, got to fix it. The other child says, don't do anything more to my family member. And then you have to get the ethicist involved. And that doesn't solve the problem either. <laughs> OK. Um, most of these folks who are end stages, they're DNR, right? And whenever we operate, we always lift the DNR status. You know, if, if they have an arrhythmia in surgery, we're going to shock them because they've consented to go undergo a procedure. So there's, you know, is it correct in somebody who can't change their advanced directive to change it temporarily for surgery? I mean, you really are going against some people's advanced directive to replace their batteries. Um, quality of life. I mean, these people come into our office in a wheelchair, and we're like, wow. It doesn't look like a very good quality of life to me. But we're really not the right people to judge that. You know, a lot of these people, they look very disabled. They live a very disabled life. But they feel like they have a good quality of life. And their family members, have, they have a good quality of life. We really should not be the ones to judge that. Or should we? There's a lot of practical issues to think about. Um, who's going to take care of the patient? Is there a family member to help with the management after surgery? Uh, and then what are the risks to the patient? What's the real infection rate? What's the real, uh, you know, damaging the lead in surgery? We've all done that. And the question is, is, is there a clinical indication? Is the stimulation helping the patient have a benefit that's worthy of replacing the battery? So these are some of the, the, the factors to consider. So I went back and we looked at our uh, battery life. We're still kind of parsing this out because I didn't get enough time to finish this. But this is all batteries and all patients. And this is the average duration until battery, the first battery replacement after surgery. So our average was three and a half years. Uh, but there's quite a range, basically from two to, two to six years almost. Depends on the disease, depends on the battery type, depends on obviously the stimulation parameters, all these different things factor into the battery life. But you know, anywhere from two to five years is the battery duration, at least in our system. Uh, we went back, at, we, we keep a very careful log of all of our patients for QA, so we know our infection risk. This is our, our data. But for this study, this talk today, I went and I dug up the cardiac numbers. Okay, that's what's on the right, cardiac pacemaker. The Danes, wow. They studied 44,000 cardiac pacemakers, <laughs> and they had the data for everybody in Denmark, 1982, 2007, and their infection rate for initial implantation is 0.18% per patient year. So um, I tend not to think of infection rate in patient years. I tend to think of it in terms of patients. This patient had an infection, they didn't. But a lot of infections happen from erosions in a delayed fashion. So my numbers look a lot better when I divide patient years into my infection rate. It goes from 5.5% to 1%. <laughs> 
Uh, but my, that's my infection rate for all, all the patients in Spokane for 15 years is 5.5% of the patients. A lot of that is erosions and delayed infections. Um, but so it's not a benign procedure. You get an infection in a, in a battery replacement in a severely disabled patient. They get, you've got to come back for more surgery. It involves the brain. You've got to take the whole system out. Then they're on antibiotics and PICC line. And it's going to probably kill the patient if they get an infection in their end stage. So ethics. I put one slide for ethics. Uh, the good of the individual versus the good of the whole, which is beneficence versus justice. You guys do remember that anyway. So I, I think the real issue here is the ethics of futility. And futility, the ethical term futility is when a clinician believes that a treatment has no benefit and is not indicated, and it's therefore futile. And it's in conflict with a family member or a patient who wants the therapy that believes that it's therapeutic. And that's exactly what we're dealing with here. Is D DBS battery replacement an end stage a futile treatment or not, and that's up to the ethicist. But it's also up to the doctor to think about, and it's up to the patient. But when we deny surgical replacement of these batteries to patients, we can use the ethical argument of futility. This is a futile treatment. It doesn't make sense to do it, even if you want that surgery. So my line in the sand, the really practical issues that I've worked through, and uh, and the question and answer time after this is, I'm really curious what other people are doing because I don't have an answer to this problem. But I have a few lines in the sand. If a patient comes in and they're on hospice, I probably won't replace the battery. Okay, Because that means the patients and the families have made the decision not to do any more aggressive interventions for the patient. But almost all these patients come back, they come to the clinic, and they're on hospice, but they still want you to replace the battery. All right, it's really easy if there's a serious medical problem. They got lung cancer, they got a terminal diagnosis of some sort, or severe end stage heart disease. Um, you know, it's easy at that point to say, no, it doesn't make sense. We're, we're not going to replace your battery. Um, the bottom two are really one. You, oh, man, I've been burned by these patients sometimes. I won't, will not replace a battery if the patient doesn't have social support uh, because it's not. It's not the job of the neurosurgeon at the time of the battery replacement to sort out end-stage psychosocial issues. It's the wrong time. Um, and so you got to watch out for the family member who's going to drop the patient off and then not be there to talk to after surgery and say, oh, well, I'm going out of town. <laughs> and then you admit the patient to the hospital and then the social services, and they spend a week in the hospital trying to get placement in a new facility. It's the wrong way to do that. It's not the right time for that problem to be sorted out. So the fact is, when I look at the patients and I say to myself, ooh, I probably shouldn't replace this battery, I still do. <laughs> um, and the fact is the patients come back and most of them are fine and they get through surgery and they appreciate you replacing it. Okay, so here's how I approach this problem. And I'll be honest, I kind of developed this lately, and I haven't applied it to every patient, um, but I think it makes a lot of logical sense. Uh, I try and have two visits. So the patient comes to see me, and I'm like, ooh, I'm not sure we should do this surgery. Um, we have a conversation about that, and sometimes I can just talk the, the patient out of the surgery, the family, and say, yeah, let's not do it. Um, and then we get address the DNR issues, and we start with some social services, and we go down the road of, we're done treating your Parkinson's. It's time to put you in hospice, okay? If the family's insistent, then what I do is an off-stimulation trial. So they come back for a second visit, either with me or with neurology, and they turn their stimulator off the day before. So overnight, they're off stimulation. They can take their medicines, that's fine, but we really wanna see what in the world the stimulator's doing. And the fact is these patients never turn their stimulator off. They don't actually know what it's doing. They think it's doing something, but they don't know. So they come to the office. Um, you know, sometimes we do a UPDRS if they're really malignant and we got to prove something. We turn the stimulator on and we do a clinical judgment. The surgeon gets to see the benefit. And there, there actually is benefit, even in stage five. Uh, the family and the patient get to see the benefit. And if we all think there's enough, I'll go ahead and replace the battery. 
that's i think a very logical approach for a challenging scenario i don't know if anyone else has any other great ideas of how to work through that ok so a couple tricks i just want to share with you these are things i learned from the uh, learned from experience and failures and mistakes and um, I know in my training, we got three three of us here that train with Kim Birchall. I don't know if I ever did a battery replacement as a resident. I mean, his fellows always did it, and it was in. So we were never involved in these. I just kind of learned this on my own. Here's how I do it now. Uh, it's an outpatient surgery. Um, it's not an overnight stay in the hospital. They go home from the recovery room, um, even in these ex very advanced patients. Uh, I minimize the amount of, of anesthetic. I don't do these with general anesthesia. I do them just with a little propofol conscious sedation. I put a lot of local in. That means you have to tie their arms down. I've had patients help me in surgery. The hands come underneath the drapes. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> so put some wrist restraints on if you're going to do light conscious sedation and a lot of local. Um, check the impedance beforehand because I only prep out the batteries. But if there's a fracture in the lead, you're going to have to replace the extension lead. And that's a totally different scenario, a general anesthesia case. So make sure that you get the parameters beforehand and your, your uh, electronic reps make sure that the impedance is working. Um, Post-op analgesia, you know, uh, try not to give too many narcotics to these old folks if we can avoid it. Um, they need to take their Parkinson's meds. Some of them think, oh, it's like like the implant. I'm not going to take my meds the night before. And then they come in and they're really off. And then you give them anesthesia and you won't be able to get them out of the recovery room. You'll have to admit them. So uh, that's one of the tricks is to make sure they take their meds. In fact, you probably need to give them a little extra boost, you know, another half a tab of Cinemed or something uh, in the recovery room to kind of wake them up. Uh, send them back to where they came from. If they're a nursing home, a facility, uh, and have a really, really high threshold to admit them to the hospital. The patients look at the end stage like they need to be in the hospital after surgery, but they have coped and compensated and have adapted to living with their severe disability. They should be able to go back to where they came from. At least in Spokane, I don't order physical therapy. Because, oh man, the physical therapist walks in, they're like, wow. You need to be in a nursing home. <laughs> and then suddenly the chart's full of these requirements for this and that. So I've basically stopped getting my rehab medicine people involved in these advanced cases. Even after first surgery, I just I do the right thing. Um, and I try these do these cases early in the morning so that uh, the patients can get back home. Uh, a couple tricks for complication avoidance. I, Pete, you're going to talk about this later. Hopefully I'm not taking a little bit of your your wind here. Um, I don't use scissors. I use the Bovi. It's totally against the rules of Medtronics, but I've never had a problem with a Bovi in a system. Is anybody? Yes. Um, there is a uh, platform blade, which is also a monopolar artery, which does not heat up to the same level as uh, the Bovi, and you can actually take it right on an extension cord, DBS feed, and it will not. Cool. I need to get one of those. I've bovied everything. I've never had a problem. I even bovied a cracked lead. Well, I didn't know it was cracked till after I bovied it. But. Oh, well, that's, I should be able to get one of those then. Okay, so uh, try not to cut the wires. <laughs> it's always a heart-sinking event. Like, oh, my God. Um, watch for the vicral allergies, you know. Use nylon in these old folks because uh, they pick at things. They're demented. They're like, yeah, and they'll pick it open. And they have to come for a post-op visit. This is where I've run into trouble. They, uh, they go back to the nursing home. And nobody's giving them a bath. And, and then they come uh, two months later, and their wound's open. And it's, oh, well, look, the dressing's still on it. <laughs> they got to come for a visit. OK. So you know, feedback and control, right? As you, the more you 
the longer you practice medicine, you got to learn from your mistakes. So what I've learned from these patients replacing DBS batteries and end-stage disease impacts how I decide to operate on patients, who, who I decide to operate on. So the problems that are mild at the initial placement become dramatic at the end-stage disease. Don't implant crazy patients because they're going to get crazier and then they're going to be really crazy at the end stage and you'll be like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Okay. Um, our psychologists do a pretty good job of screening these folks out, but they can slip through. I have a much lower tolerance for patients with marginal behavioral issues um, because they just become a bad flag for park, for center, for DBS. Um, dementia, you know, we all, we got the patients, well, they're not that demented, you know, they're still living at home, that we really need to implant them, they really need treatment. The problem is, in a few more years, when you come to do the battery replacement, the demented patients are really demented, and then you're like, ooh, should we do this or not? So the dementia problem multiplies over time. You know, you slip by a few patients. Um, Family support, we already talked about that. I, I believe ethically that I can decide and tell a patient I am not going to replace your battery. I think you have an ethical basis to stand on the principle of futility. If you really don't think there's a benefit and you turn the system on and off and there's no benefit, I think we can tell families no. And as the surgeons in the region, I think we all ought to band together. And if some other surgeon says, no, I won't replace it, we we should consider that as a pretty reasonable thing and maybe not replace each other's batteries and people we say no to.